And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on public means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Well, thank you to our listeners for joining us tonight for another Connecting the Dots program. Uh, Tonight is uh, June 29th, 2017, and we have tonight a repeat, or at least a repeat guest from a previous show. That is uh, Mr. Harry Boyens. He is a Ph.D. in uh, physics, and he is the author of a tremendous uh, biography and historical work called Amahulu, and that is the birth and death of the second America. And uh, Harry, I welcome you to the program. And uh, if you would please give our listeners a brief uh, kind of a bio of of you and uh, why you want Americans to pay attention to the recent developments that are going on in South Africa. Well, Dan, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, secondly, apologies to your listeners for the somewhat clipped British-like accent. That's what we sound like from South Africa. Uh, I guess a quick bio would be that uh, I was indeed born down there uh, back in the early 50s. And when my mother hoisted me onto her arms and pointed out Sputnik to me, that was the day I decided I wanted to be a scientist. I no longer wanted to be either a jet pilot or a farmer or a train driver. And uh, that is what I eventually became. I ended up in uh, R&D, research and development in South Africa, uh, first uh, military-related, and then when peace broke out everywhere, as they say, uh, we changed that to uh, beating guns into plowshares and ended up doing interesting things, um, sometimes in the company of uh, the U.S. defense world. Um, In the end, I moved uh, with my family to Canada in around 2000, and we now live uh, on the northern outskirts of Vancouver in in Canada. And right behind my house are 150-foot trees, and it's nothing funny for me to have four bears in the backyard at the same time. I got the photographic evidence of that. So I've moved from a desert country to rainforest, and about 14,000 miles in the process. Amabulu, why do I want uh, the United States to be aware of this? Um, first of all, I, I have to congratulate you as a nation in, uh, I guess, dodging a serious bullet with this last election. The, uh, the United States, uh, as, as the Obama administration went on, I swear to you, it looked more and more and more and more like South Africa until when it got to... Uh, at the time of the St. Louis Ferguson uh, trouble, um, the pictures were identical. I was reliving 1986 South Africa. You had somehow managed to find yourself a president who managed to really divide that country of yours. Now, uh, that might sound critical, but please see it through my eyes. It it was the same flames, the same smoke, the same V-hulled armored vehicles, the same guys with the guns, the same... uh, half insane crowds and stuff uh, I was reliving all of that so uh, there's there's a greater picture here that, that bothers me in that sorry I have some noise here just to get rid of and uh, I, I feel that partly you've dodged the bullet and I wanted to find a way of describing that bullet because uh, you could step onto that path again and uh, walk yourselves right into a minefield. Um, well, that's very good, Harry. I, I too, I want to mention the fact. I know you well enough. I know that your comments—they're not based on any uh, a, any form of uh, recognition of, of race or anything else. It's intended to be strictly a political and a cultural. Uh, snapshot of what's happening in America and what uh, happened in South Africa. Am I correct with that? 
Oh, absolutely. And uh, so I, I was thinking that one thing we might do, if this fits with your uh, uh, hopes for this show, is to look at some uh, proper parallels between South Africa and the United States. Uh, and I hope to do that in order to clarify where folks typically have some truly inappropriate parallels that do damage, serious damage. Oh, I think that's terrific, uh, Harry. I think that's a perfect, uh, perfect way to approach it. So why don't you go ahead and start with some of those parallels and explain what they are. Okay. So um, now and then I'll go, go back to this book of mine because it, it, it is like a bit of a text that one can follow in this regard. Um, the title is Amabulu, which means nothing more than uh, the Bulu people, which is the Amakosa language corruption of the Buru people, which is the Dutch word for farmers. So Amabulu means the farmer people. Now, uh, the subtitle is The Birth and Death of the Second America. Now, where on earth do I get this Second America thing from? And this is important. Adam Smith, when he wrote his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations in 1776, he wrote, the discovery of America and that of the passage to the East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Admittedly, it was 1776, but that should tell you something right there. And then I would like to move on uh, some... Uh, 21 years later, after the Brits had managed to lose your uh, war of independence, they were terribly worried about suffering that kind of damage elsewhere. Now, to the extent that their colonies in the United States had grown up and shaken off uh, their presence, their Rear Admiral Thomas Pringle, who was the British naval commander at the Cape of Good Hope in 1797, wrote... As the colony, this is the Cape, as the colony improved and its peoples increased, it would to us only prove a second America and would more than likely in time rob us of India. And there wow. you have it. Mm -hmm. Based on that, I developed the story of the birth and death of the second America. Britain was really worried that it would suffer another American experience. Okay, then, good. And, and, and uh, ex explain uh, explain that situation exactly how the uh, that parallel developed in South Africa. Well, there's actually a very direct connection. When in uh, 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 in the mid 70s, when uh, in the in the middle of your War of Independence, the uh, the French and the British both raced to get to Cape Town because whoever controlled the Cape of Good Hope controlled the oceans of the planet. It was that simple. That, that is how much of a bottleneck and control point that was. That was the choke point of all naval activity on the planet. So the two parties raced for the Cape, almost simultaneous fleets. But the British were uh, ended up uh, for refreshments and things in one of the islands in the mid-Atlantic, and the French caught them napping while their sailors and soldiers uh, were uh, at certain institutions on the land, shall we say. Uh, the French arrived, shot up the Brits, raced for the Cape, put their soldiers down there in agreement with the Dutch. The Brits immediately went off to lick their wounds, and the French had control of the ocean, and that is why they could help you and keep the Brits from reinforcing their guys on your territory. That is why you won the War of Independence. I wonder how many Americans realize that. <laughs> so uh, the British, for them, this was such a miserable experience that they said, never, ever again. And so in 1795, when Napoleon appeared on the scene, one of the first British decisions was, go for the Cape, take it immediately, go for the Cape. So they sent a fleet to come and take the Cape, uh, but with a letter in hand from the Dutch, uh, uh, 
I'm not sure what the right terminology is for the leader of the Dutch at that stage, but uh, he had fled to England and the Brits kind of coerced him into writing a letter to his various governors of his various colonies and establishments to say, please surrender yourselves to the British. They are our friends. They have sworn they will return everything at the end of the war. So they turned up with a letter like that at Cape Town and the Dutch governor wouldn't relent and it ended up in a fight and the Brits took the place anyway. That was 1795. So having got their foothold at the Cape, their rear admiral, Thomas Pringle, who was Nelson's boss, by the way, um, he uh, basically spoke these words. As the colony improved and its peoples increased, it would to us only prove a second America and would more likely in time rob us of India. These things are directly connected. Okay? Okay, good. So I thought I would give you those two little quotes from history. Not my words, great men who lived long time ago. So if I may, I would like to proceed to some really proper parallels that might make your eyes pop here and there. Absolutely. Uh, firstly, um, and please interrupt me at any time. Um, firstly, both were settled by the Dutch and their Belgian counterparts, by the way, Walloons typically, French Belgians, in the early to mid-1600s. In the case of the United States, they uh, started up things in the very early 1600s in the New York area with uh, New Netherland or New Netherlands and uh, Fort Oranje, Fort Orange, Albany, things like that. Both were stolen by the Brits, New York in 1664 and the Cape of Good Hope in 1795. One of my family ancestors was living in New Amsterdam better known as New York at the time. And a couple of months later, he went to the orphan chamber, the place that protects all the wills and things, and said, please, can I have the money paid out? i got to leave. I no longer know how to make a living here. And he went off back to Holland. The Brits allowed them to leave. So, you know, I can trace my family ancestry back to New York. In fact, his children then moved to Cape Town and settled there and became the first ever American immigrants to South Africa in 1666. So the connection is quite close. Mm. Now, both parties, both nations, were eventually sold out to the British by their Dutch founders, great ancestors we have, we have collectively. They sold us out. New York was exchanged in 1674 for Suriname or Dutch Guiana on the north coast of South America. The Cape was sold to in 1814 for three million pounds sterling and free access to refreshment to the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, we became subjects with no voted representation until the 1850s. Both groups of people, and I can show you that in books of the history of New York, both were referred to by British military authority as damn boers, which for, for the Dutch, the word boer was too easily corrupted to boer. As I pointed out, the uh, Dutch word boer uh, just means farmer. That's all. Nothing deep. Mm -hmm. Both groups struggled against indigenous people. In America, it was versus uh, Indian indigenous people. At the Cape, it was versus black people. But while the Indians were present at points along the coast, very close to the American settlements, the black people of Africa were 600 miles away from Cape Town and were not even met for two generations. So at the Cape, the first clashes were 130 years after the settlement at the Cape. Before that, the black people lived even further away. So it was a later development in South Africa. Uh, and there was, by the way, goes the whole idea that people have that there were black people on the beach at Cape Town when the Dutch arrived there. It's rubbish. Next, both had tough frontier folks who knew at a tender age how to pick a horse, ride it, and shoot from its back. Same people same challenges. Both relied on a strong and a rather hard-bitten Calvinistic faith. The original Dutch Reformed Church of New York, while it's now no longer the main denomination in the U.S., is historically exactly the same church as the South African Dutch Reformed Church, attended by most white South Africans. Both countries have a strong Presbyterian line running through them. Both proudly clung to their guns and their Bibles, so to speak. Do I vaguely recall you had a president who, who thought it clever to utter that phrase? Yeah, we sure did, and very recently, too. Well, i got to tell you that when I heard him say that, I jumped up and I said, yeah, you got it, that's right, that's us, too. 
it should be no surprise the Dutch Reformed Church in two of the four provinces of the earlier South Africa was founded by an American by the name of Daniel Lindley. He was a Presbyterian minister to the parish of Rocky River in North Carolina. He mm. settled in the Natal province of South Africa in the district of Kliprafir, which means, wait for it, Rocky River. So he mm. went from Rocky River to Rocky River, two continents apart. Folks liked him a lot because he knew how to pick a horse, ride it, and shoot from its back. Okay? Because mm -hmm. that's why he was so acceptable. Both nations relied on a philosophy of what I would call praise the Lord and pass the ammo, and both knew how to make every single shot count. Both saw mass migrations by wagon. It was horse-drawn typically westwards in the U.S. It was ox-drawn northeastward in South Africa. Both knew what a wagon circle was and how to lay out a defensive field of fire. Both nations fought two wars for their freedom against British imperialism and overlordship. Both won their first the USA in the late 1700s, South Africa in the late 1800s. So there's a whole bunch of parallels in history there. All of those I can defend nicely with facts, numbers, dates, people, you name it. Okay? Mm -hmm. But a problem arose in the 1960s. And that is that first Martin Luther King and then later more specifically Bobby Kennedy Bobby visited South Africa in June 1966. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, he, he visited there to grandstand for the media. The proper parallels were not lost on him, but then he chose to warp the picture. And, and I want to read you exactly what he said. Here are his words, and listen to how he did it. Okay. He said to an audience down there, I come here this evening because of my deep interest and affection for a land settled by the Dutch in the mid-17th century, then taken over by the British, and at last independent, a land in which the native inhabitants were at first subdued but relations with whom remain a problem to this day, a land which defined itself on a hostile frontier, a land which has tamed rich natural resources through the energetic application of modern technology, a land which was once the importer of slaves and must now struggle to wipe out the last traces of that former bondage. I refer, of course, to the United States of America. Unquote. End. Bobby Kennedy. Okay? Now, mm -hmm. call me a naive kid from the bush in Africa, but I figure that was playing to a U.S. audience using a South African podium. Mm -hmm. Okay? And right there started the problem that folks in the U.S. thought that, oh, right, um, all the political problems in South Africa, that's just a sort of a mirror image of what's happened in the U.S., etc., and, 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 and people could match these two stories up and then look for outrage in various ways. Okay? Now, none of what I'm about to explain to you does away with the fact that I think apartheid was wrong, and that I, even worse, I thought it was stupid, okay? But here are some things that folks need to understand. First of all, the black history of South Africa and America, folks claim, is the same. I'm sorry, but that's just, it's rubbish. Black people in the United States come overwhelm, or came overwhelmingly as slaves from overseas, typically from Africa or via Brazil and usually via the services of Portuguese, British, or later American slavers. Black people in South Africa come from the east of the country and never knew slavery, except at the hand of their own. To this day, they can tell you where their parents and grandparents came from in the east of the country. Okay? This is not a group of people that were transported from elsewhere and then had their culture changed. Well, Matt, um, Harry, Harry, that's a really important thing to point out because I think there's... Uh, at, at least in in many circles, there's a feeling that uh, somehow the South African, the Afrikaners, were uh, slaveholders and that they were people that oppressed the blacks, and that j just is not so. Am I right? Well, I I think there really were situations in South Africa where I, I don't think things were fair to black people. I don't think things were equitable. I don't think they were allowed exactly the same opportunities. But the base from where that came is a completely different thing. And if, if you allow me, I'll, I'll get to that, get sure. that and articulate it very specifically. I sure. just wanted to cover a couple of short points in terms of how these false parallels develop. And then I'll nail that 
thing in clearly for you. Both countries are defined, people say that both countries are defined by a master-slave relationship uh, that they're trying to live down. It's nonsense. There may be a, a master-slave history in the U.S., but in South Africa, it's a clash of opposing civilizations. The, fo the, the black folks were there in the country to the east. Okay? It's not as though they were anybody's slaves. Right. The next point is black people, people, folks say that black people in South Africa are the same as black people in America. That's nonsense. Black Americans are by rights exactly that, namely black Americans. They are just Americans who happen to be black, as though that's supposed to make a difference. They're not, and I, I repeat, not African Americans. I know the term is used, but you have no idea how much damage that peculiar terminology causes. That misnomer causes horrific errors of judgment and decision making in my book. Uh, if you wish, I'm an African American and I happen to be white. Mm. I happen to not be a black American. I live on the continent of America. I may be in Canada. I'm still an American because I'm on the continent of America. I come from Africa. I'm an African American. Okay. Mm -hmm. The very name of my nation, Afrikaner, means to be an African, exactly the same way as you, Dan, are an American. I can prove my ancestry there back to 1652 in detail, on paper, hard evidence. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, black Americans may think they have certain aspects of culture that allow them to claim some form of uh, unique uh, culture in the U.S., but their home language is you know, typically English. They're typically Christian or Muslim. They typically have only one wife by law. Uh, in the end, at the end of the day, my comment is, you know, for me as a young guy who went to America in 1979, it was an interesting experience to get to do with lots of black Americans. And I got on with the folks just famously because to me they were Americans. They were just black. I couldn't understand the big deal. Okay. I mean, that, that one of the first questions I ever got in America, in, in the United States, was trying to get a place to stay. And a very nice lady asked me, you know, sort of under her breath over the phone in New York, she said, Harry, are you black? And I was thinking, now, uh, what am I supposed to do with that? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't know how to respond even. I told her, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm from Africa, but I'm, I'm Lily White. Is that a problem? You know. Um, so the other thing is, in South Africa, uh, there, there are more than 11 black nations. The Khoza people speak Isi Khoza, that's their language. The Sutu people speak Sutu. The Zulu people speak Isi Zulu. The Tswana people speak their own Sana language. Each has his own historical territory. So this, they're not unlike the Cherokee, who basically come from the east of the U.S. and got badly displaced the Sioux of South Dakota, or, or frankly, in your part of the world, the Flathead Indians of Montana, who speak their own Salish language. The black people of South Africa have no confusion about their culture or their origin. They know it's different from the white folks. They know it's got a completely different origin. Uh, this differs dramatically from the U.S. experience of skin color, where m most of this cultural distinction was lost for black people. It was replaced by Western culture. So, you know, we look from South Africa and we can't figure out what is it that folks can't understand in the Northern Hemisphere. And when one has lived in, in, in the United States for a while, you realize that folks project. They, they, they take their own history and then they, they project it on what they perceive must be the issue in South Africa. But uh, again, none of this changes the fact that I personally believe that apartheid was wrong. And as a scientist, there's you know, an even greater sin in my mind, and that is it was stupid. <laughs> okay? okay. Um, so I, I wanted to point out these, these uh, parallels and false parallels, correct parallels and false parallels. Okay? So the historical events, yeah, they are amazingly parallel. And uh, the, the overlap of the people... Um, probably DNA-wise, you're going to find it difficult to find closer, folks closer to Americans than, than the South Africans. In terms of outlook on life, probably just as difficult to find people closer. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, holding on to our Bibles and our guns and, and all of that stuff, it, it, it speaks to me. I understand that stuff. Um, 
But in the matter of what folks in the U.S. do when they project issues of race in the United States onto South Africa, uh, it, it, that does a great evil. It really does. It, it, it really creates a disaster. And I trace it all back to Bobby Kennedy, and it was, uh, he was responding to something from Martin, Martin Luther King at the time. Dan, with that, that's my story on proper parallels and improper parallels. Um, I should shut up and give you... No, a... actually, you're doing very well here. I, the, the thing that uh, I, I want our listeners to understand, not only the parallels that you discussed, but um, also I, I want you to kind of go very briefly through the history after right uh, before 1900, when uh, really when the, uh, the, the Boer War and some of the other... Uh, historical things happened, and how the British, uh, let's say, were predators on on the uh, Dutch and French uh, settlers that were there, and how that impacted so much of the political structure of South Africa. Let me, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to get over the early bit really quickly because I I think there's another little block that we ought to address in uh, tonight's session, and that is just cooperation between the United States and South Africa uh, since the since 19 between 1900 and 1950 uh, odd okay excellent good um, mm -hmm. so uh, about that history very quickly uh, South Africa uh, the settlement started at the Cape of Good Hope in 1652 uh, yes I actually had an ancestor ancestor a little girl standing on the beach when the Dutch arrived she became a uh, interpreter for the Dutch commander, so that's some of my indigenous blood. Um, then, as time moved on, around the 1680s, uh, the French Huguenots, like your Paul Revere was a good example of a Huguenot, uh, the French Huguenots arrived, and uh, uh, I would say where the, where the original Dutch founding had all to do with business and trade and all that kind of stuff, the Dutch, uh, sorry, the French brought an infusion of, uh, shall we call it, uh, religious principle. So these were hard-bitten Calvinist Huguenots who had been persecuted in France and knew something about standing up for their beliefs. So they fled, settled at the Cape, and named their farms all kinds of names of places you can find today still in Provence in, in France. They, they named their estates. Later, most of those became leading wine estates, and you can buy their wines in uh, U.S. and Canadian uh, stores today. Um, History moved on around uh, 1780, just before that. The first clashes happened with, with black folks about 600 miles east of Cape Town. The black folks had been advancing down the coast, and uh, the white folks moving eastwards. The two lots ran into each other around about that point, and it became a dispute about land. Uh, now, Life kind of went on in a somewhat unstable fashion until 1795, at which point the Dutch East India Company that had run the place was bankrupt, and the British invaded because of Napoleon, and they took the Cape. And uh, in the first round, they had no clue what they had inherited. They thought my ancestors were French Jacobins, you know, like the ones who were guillotining people in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they immediately thought that this must be the enemy. They took off my ancestors' guns and things, their ability to defend themselves, and promptly the black people invaded. <laughs> uh, the British lost half the colony in that effort, and then they made peace by, I, I, I swear to you, they paid tribute to those black folks. Mm. They got their colony back by paying tribute. <laughs> okay. And I have it black on white from the subsequent British governor. He said his predecessor had uh, made use of the only uh, mechanism left to him, which was paying tribute to men with spears. That's how he put it. Um, life went on, and it, it might have improved because the Brits actually started sending men who knew what they were doing and who, who spoke to these farmers on the, on the frontier, and things started to settle. And lo and behold, Napoleon and the Brits start fighting again. So the Brits vacate. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the f first the uh, uh, that British gave it back to the Dutch, and then the fighting broke out again. So the Brits came a second time, this time with 60 ships with an army, and they took the Cape. 
this time really uh, in a big way, and that, that was permanent. By 1814, uh, the Dutch basically, uh, with Napoleon defeated, the Dutch made a deal with the Brits by which they paid about uh, 30 million pounds. Uh, sorry, where the Brits paid the Dutch 30 million pounds for the Cape, and that was the end. The Brits now had not just conquered the place, they had bought it. So from now on, or from that point on, the Brits were in complete control of the Cape. Um, very shortly after this, there was an event uh, that really started the nastiness, and that is that um, there was a, a circuit court held in which a bunch of missionaries accused these farmers on the border uh, of mistreating their employees and supposedly murdering them. The Brits then sent a court around to, to hear these cases, and uh, all the cases were eventually declared not, not null and void, but here and there there was some abuse, but nothing like murder or anything like that. Uh, to such a degree that the British judges uh, really uh, climbed into the missionary stations and told them, stop lying. The, uh, but that had caused so much distrust on that border between the, the Dutch farmers and the British authorities. And in the middle of all this, there was a dispute between a farmer and his one worker. The uh, worker went to the uh, magistrate. The magistrate sent a troop of army guys to arrest the farmer who said, I'm not having any of this, and the shooting started. And uh, the end result of that is the farmer is killed, the brother swore uh, revenge, and uh, after that, not much of a shot was really fired, but the British caught the guys and tried to hang all five. Four of the sets of ropes broke. Since all people in that district had been forced to watch the execution, they saw the ropes broke, were breaking. And uh, that was seen as a sign from God that this is an unfair hanging. And uh, the end result is the Brits came and just simply hanged the guys again. And really? that was it. From that moment on, it was out between Brit and Booth. <laughs> That's something you don't do on uh, Afrikaners' watch. You know, that that was, as far as they were concerned, is a slap in the face of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that set the tone for everything else that followed. Uh, the Brits would, uh, their attitudes and behavior and policies would vary from a military extreme and then to a missionary extreme, then to a military extreme. And it made the life of these uh, frontier farmers absolute hell. So eventually, after the latest, the Sixth Frontier War, these guys packed their wagons, wrote a very respectful uh, memorandum, submitted it to the newspapers, and ended it with, uh, we trust that um, uh, uh, His Majesty's government has no more to demand from us. They packed their wagons and their Bibles and their families, and they left northwards into darkest Africa. They, they knew not what else they could do. Their existence had become impossible. They had no representation, they had no freedom, they, had, they could do nothing about their own lot, and these Brits were just, just making a complete mess of things. So uh, they went north. No, they did not have any slaves, nor did they take any slaves. That was something that the British used to uh, stir up feelings against them. And you don't have to believe me, you can believe the Canadian historian Thiel. Uh, who said later when the Brits again took the, the, the farmer's territory, he said the one good thing about the British taking it is they could discover for themselves that there were no slaves. Um, anyway, so they moved north, and after clashes with uh, two different black nations, the Zulu and the Matabele, they eventually settled in the interior. Uh, the Brits first annexed them near the coast, then they annexed them again in the interior. This happened like three, four, five, six times. And eventually, uh, the British just decided this was too much trouble. They leave these dumb boers, as they call them, in the interior of the country where they cannot do any mischief. And they actually wrote the words to that effect. Well, of course, that changed completely the day that one of these supposedly dumb boers discovered diamonds. Suddenly, the British were extremely concerned about the indigenous people in that particular area where the diamonds were. 
and uh, there was a big debate, a uh, big uh, performance back and forth, and as you can imagine and predict, the Brits annexed the piece of land with the diamond fields. And, Harry, uh, would you give our, our listeners a, an approximate uh, date for that uh, that that happenstance? Yeah, you're you're roughly in the 1860s now. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So things went on happily, and then the British got this idea into their head that they should unite everything in that part of the world into one single British Southern Africa, and. Having suffered these guys before, the Afrikaners weren't going to have any of this, so that uh, when Britain annexed the little Transvaal Boer Republic, well, not so little, it's probably a sizable fraction of Texas, uh, uh, they resisted, ultimately resisted, and lo and behold, they defeat the British at every battle. And this is, now we're in 1881, and... Uh, the British decide that it's better to just give these guys their independence, and that was the status after 1881. So fine, everything goes forward, but in 1895, we now have Cecil John Rhodes in the picture. He had come to the diamond fields at Kimberley, had made his millions, and if ever there was an imperialist, he defines the word. Uh, you do need to understand that the, the that you know, there's so many folks who are Rhodes scholars. I wonder how many of them realize that he put in his first will that his intention was to use his millions to recover the United States for Britain. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, he really did write that. And create and and create a a world that was British. Uh, pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, he got it into his head to. Um, Tell a gentleman by the name of Leander Star Jemison, he would uh, he would give him the soldiers, which as fate would have it included uh, a great uncle of my wife's, and these guys would be all all be members of the British South Africa Company, which is Rhodes's company. He had them trained up, and on a good day in 1895, he sent these guys in to invade the little Transvaal Republic. Only. As usual, they miscalculated, and the Boers were waiting for them, and they were utterly defeated. But it was quite clear that the British government and Rhodes and the Rothschild bankers and all those guys were behind this. So uh, the, the Afrikaners started uh, buying weapons, typically from Germany, Krupp cannon, Moser rifles, etc., smokeless rounds all that kind of stuff, so that they were well armed by 1899 when the British started maneuvering to force them into submission. Uh, I can make a long story out of it, but the, the short version of it is that Alfred Milner, who is a name that you may know, he was at that point uh, governor of the Cape Colony, while Rhodes was the prime minister, uh, over that era, that period, Alfred Milner uh, started to press the uh, Transvaal Republic, essentially telling them they must give all British citizens who are there the vote, which, of course, would have caused the Afrikaners to be outvoted in their own country. So what a choice. What kind of a choice is that? Right, right. Okay. And uh, it, 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 uh, if you don't mind me saying this, it kind of smacks of what happened in Iraq when people expected the Sunni to just roll over and uh, have uh, a vast majority of Shiite just rule them by vote. Mm -hmm. um, the, the results are predictable because we've lived them. <laughs> and the, the end result is uh, the two little republics, two republics uh, gave Britain an ultimatum to withdraw its troops from their borders and that is how 40,000 farmers and their sons declared war on the greatest empire the world had seen to that day. And what happened in the next couple of weeks uh, shocked the British Empire to its core because the British were roundly defeated on all three fronts of the war. They were completely, completely broken on the Western Front. Uh, it, it's not just that they were defeated. I mean, it was really humiliating 
losses for them, uh, which probably was a mistake because now the Brits were really worked up. They called on their entire um, empire, and in the end, every single British land unit on the books fought in South Africa except for those stations in India and one Lancer unit in England. The rest all got the colors for having served in South Africa. Not just that, but Australians went and Canadians went and Rhodesians went, etc., etc., etc. The first bit of it was a, was a formal regular war, and then it turned, obviously, uh, as it was, you know, there was no other way, it turned into a guerrilla war. The British response to that was the creation of concentration camps. And uh, in the end, 30,000 of our women and children died in British concentration camps. So before folks think, think that the Germans invented concentration camps, I'm sorry, guys, it's the Brits who did it, and they did it in 1901. Of the people with my surname, Boyens, of those who went into those camps, 57% died there. And... Um, I recently published an article to say that at the same time while my people died, the New York Times ran an article to say that they have it on reliable authority that Boer women are allowed to play tennis and are having a roaring good time in those camps. They okay. obviously weren't, uh, weren't New there. New York Times, right? So I'm not sure how that particular newspaper lives down its dismemberment of history. So uh, there's a shall we call it a, a little bit of an attitude on our part towards that newspaper? Well, I you know that maybe we could uh, Harry you call that the uh, the uh, fake news of South Africa. Uh, well, you you had you had to wait until you know 2017. We knew it in 1900. Yeah, sure did. Um, so the, the interesting thing, I guess, uh, uh, from the perspective of, of, of folks who, who talk about the New World Order and so forth, is that that war was financed by the Rothschilds. It was precipitated by, well, planned, if you wish, instigated by Cecil John Rhodes. It was overseen by the Minister of Colonies, Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain, a name that you should remember. His son was the one that gave us the Second World War. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alfred Milner. Uh, those four names, I think, feature fairly centrally in the theories around the New World Order scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, and wasn't uh, Milner uh, later the uh, 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 English banker that uh, actually... Uh, created much of the uh, banking system in... Uh, I don't know in, if he created the banking system, but he continued to play a, a role in the in the legacy of Rhodes, so to speak. Yes, but th- yes. there, there was a tiny little bit of divine intervention or message in the sense that uh, both Rhodes and Queen Victoria uh, passed away before they saw the end of the war, and in fact, it had happened just when they were suffering some severe setbacks. So uh, they 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 did not, uh, you know, uh, leave this world uh, on the highest possible note. But Good. that's it. Uh, 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 basically, a beaten nation. Uh, they had burnt the two countries to the ground. People had to start up from nothing again. But um, in 1914. Uh, be- because the Brits gave us back uh, the right to, to vote uh, around about 1905, in 1910, the four colonies in South Africa decided to get together to form one country called the Union of South Africa. Uh, that was 1910. The first prime minister was an Afrikaner guy who had been a commando leader in the Boer War. So the wheel had gone pretty much full circle with the difference that now the Afrikaners controlled the whole country. The whole British big strategic plan had completely imploded. The uh, the thing is, with 1914, when the war arrived, Jan Smuts, who had himself been a uh, Boer commander, um, well, uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, Louis Boerta, who was the overall prime minister, Jan Smuts was a senior in the cabinet, 
At that point, when war was declared, uh, South Africa joined in on the side of the Allies. So history will record that South Africa fought along with the Americans and the British in the First World War against Germany, even though Germany had done us absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, there was this uh, peculiar interlude between the two world wars. Uh, I personally have never seen them as two wars. I've always viewed them as one war uh, with, an, with a false interlude. Uh, Jan Smuts and Louis Boota, by the way, had warned about the Treaty of Versailles and told everybody, do not do this, do not try to destroy Germany, do not humiliate Germany, please don't do this, you are making a mistake, we have lived this, we know what's going to happen, we know what the reaction will be, and sure enough, there it was, and it was called World War II. So uh, when World War II happened, South Africa again, after some internal strugglings, uh, decided to uh, fall in with the rest of the Allies, and that is how my own father-in-law ended up flying cover for the uh, American troops, American and Canadian troops, going up the spine of Italy. So uh, he was shot down twice in the Second World War, and uh, one of those times flying through German ack ack in defense of Canadian troops on the ground. So uh, we brought our side, I think. My, my, my mm -hmm. own direct uncle was also in Italy, he was a, a, a messenger guy and uh, on a motorbike. And uh, then came the Korean War, and we, we pitched in again. And then an interesting little bit that I'm pretty sure that your listeners don't know, and that is that South Africa supplied some of the fissionable material for, your two, for, for the Manhattan Project. So I didn't we know were, that. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. So we were a respected and useful member of the West as long as the West needed help. And then when we needed help, we were shunned. The, uh, yeah, I, 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 mentioned the, I mentioned the Manhattan Project. One other little cute oddity. Um, for those folks who have an unshakable belief in Wikipedia, they can look this up. That is actually the truth. Uh, Jan Smuts was tapped to replace Churchill. Jan Smuts, a Boer general from South Africa, Afrikaans kid like me, uh, was tapped to take over as prime minister in England if something should happen to Churchill at the time. The fact the the royal family had approved that. <laughs> wow! Really? Really? I've never heard that before. Uh, just go to Wikipedia, put in Jan Smuts Churchill, and just go down the page. You'll find it. Okay, wow. and the, the reference is uh, the, the the guy who who wrote it is actually the private secretary of uh, Churchill. Now, uh, then came the period over which the British Empire imploded and the French one, and they rushed as fast as their feet could carry them out of Africa. Almost all the French colonies went independent in 1960. The British kind of stumbled to the same conclusion over a period of time, and. Uh, but by the mid-1960s, already Kennedy was turning on us and refusing to supply weapons. So you can imagine the attitude of my father-in-law, you know, who'd laid his life on the line for Americans. Uh, and uh, here we are, we're being threatened by the Soviets and hordes of people north of us, and uh, we're being attacked by the West. You know, n not the vaguest attempt to understand our predicament, you know, uh, how dangerous this is, how scared we are. None of that. None of it got any... Uh, your media just never wanted to know. Just never wanted to know. And uh, so you'll forgive me if I enjoy every fraction of a second that your present president climbs into your media because each second of that is karma to me. <laughs> Well, and and, uh, and it's justified, obviously. Um, so, so that's the background of the cooperation thing. Now, in the very recent past, uh, the situation was that uh, when President Obama was uh, well, f first of all, uh, Clinton came along and he kind of shifted support. Uh, let me put it like this: um, Senior Bush had made it clear that the ANC party in South Africa is a terrorist group. That's Mandela's party. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had the evidence of it. Uh, you, can, you can find the, the, the cleared CIA report 
uh, I have it. It's available on the Internet. You don't have to search too much to find it. Clearly showing their reports of what the ANC had said, what it had done, how it's targeting individual people, how it's just targeting ordinary farmers, etc., etc. Clear terrorist group. So uh, Bush Sr. had it uh, declared a terrorist organization. And uh, then Clinton came along, and in 1993, when we took away apartheid and all that stuff, Clinton quickly shifted his monies to, uh, to the ANC. Meanwhile, in the United States, uh, Mandela was being fated left, right, and center because the book written by Richard Stengel, who until recently was in the Obama White House, uh, I shouldn't say White House, administration, uh, that book had carefully removed all of Mandela's uh, involvement with the Communist Party in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So comes along uh, Clinton. He uh, basically shifts support to uh, to the ANC, and the ANC and Mandela can, can do absolutely no wrong in the eyes of the media in the United States. Forgotten are the days when they were called a terrorist organization. But on the ground in South Africa, they make laws against white people. Farmers are being murdered. And as I sit here today, of the order of 3,000 white farmers have been murdered. Um, and, and in many cases, they are tortured to death. It's only now, in 2017, reaching the news out there in the greater world, because you see some British people have now been tortured to death and in the last two months, a Dutch farmer in South Africa, not an Afrikaner, a real proper Dutchman, uh, was tortured to death. His wife had to listen to his screams for something like five hours. So now suddenly the world is waking up and realizing what I have been writing about for years. Mm-hmm. Okay? And I am, I'm worn out, you know, I'm, I'm worn out warning about all of this. And so in 2008... Folks went and elected a man who truly is an African American as opposed to a black American. Okay? President Obama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His father was Kenyan. His mother was American. When he wrote a book, he didn't write it about his mo- mother from Kansas. He wrote it about his father from Kenya. Right. I, I, you know, you figure out which influence you think was the greater one. Oh, anyway. absolutely. And I've read both books, and incidentally, they uh, they clearly point out that uh, President Obama was uh, very sympathetic, if not a communist, he was very sympathetic to the cause. I don't know about communist. I'm not going to call him one of those, but I am going to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, he was an Africanist. And here's the problem. Because of the wrong use of the term African-American, 330 million people in your country now does not understand what Africanism means. Okay? Right. Right. Uh, the closest you've ever had to it has been Malcolm X. Or the Black Panthers, possibly, to some degree. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. But, but that's the closest you've, you've ever come. And, and the point is, he goes and he, he does exactly what happened in South Africa. Uh, the ANC immediately appointed specifically people who were not white, to all the uh, security uh, departments of the country. That's exactly what he did. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, and so I looked at this and I said, guys, you don't understand what you've got. You, you don't understand what's being done to you. Uh, ultimately, you're going to feel it and it's going to hurt. Okay? And finally, it blew up in the form of Ferguson. Mm-hmm. and Black Lives Matter, and uh, uh, Pigs in a Blanket, okay? Mm-hmm. So, to me, all of that was entirely predictable. I even said that it would get worse as his term came to an end. I said it, and that's what happened. You are right. Yep. You've just dodged an Africanist bullet a completely distinct thing from black Americans who I regard as ordinary, decent Americans who just Uh happen to have a different skin color. And if that's a problem for folks, I would call them racists. Okay. Well, Harry, uh, let me ask you this. I I, uh, I appreciate all of your comments and all this history, and I think it's absolutely essential for our listeners to hear this because they need to understand 
But how do you see the Trump administration fitting into this dynamic, and how can uh, they bring us back from this abyss? So, for me, the Trump administration, as as uh, I don't know, is the word amateurish. I don't know what it is. It it fumbles. It stumbles around. Uh, uh, you know, I get frustrated some days because I feel your new president spends more time getting his foot out of his mouth than anything else. But I honestly believe his heart is actually in the right place. Mm -hmm. I really think he truly cares deeply about America. I don't think he's an ideologue at all. And I think he's the closest thing to someone who can give you back the true control of your constitution. Okay, I, I don't think you've had something like that in a while. Now, I whether it makes him an anti-New World Order guy, I don't know. All I can tell you, it is amazingly refreshing. I, I, I can sense which way he's going to make his calls. I don't like the way he phrases things, but, well, man, what a difference. So uh, I'm, I, I've got great hopes for him. And I'm also hoping that he will be the president that will finally look at South Africa and say, so far and no further. We can't have this happening on my watch. 3,000 farmers being, you know, murdered and tortured to death in the name of supposed freedom. That's just not on, on my watch. And that's what I'm praying for. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what happened in Kenya and uh uh, Robert Mugabe uh, with the uh, with the uh, white farmers in in uh, that part of Africa. This is a, a an absolutely perfect parallel for what's going on right now in in uh, in your country. Am I right? Well, I uh, certainly folks draw the parallels with 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 Kenya, but uh, you may be amused to know that one day I spoke to a young Indian lady here in Vancouver. Her parents came from Kenya, and I asked her, what does your father say about President Obama? And she said, um, he's, uh, 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 you know, he, he saw him as the same thing as what, what, what happened there. Yeah, same okay? thing, yeah, yeah. Well, what can uh, I, I guess? What, what can we do to help President Trump to, uh, to to make sure that we we do back away from this global scheme and that we do back away from what's uh, what happened to South Africa and that we make sure that we get away from this crazy Common Core social justice and all this other nonsense that's uh, part of the collectivist movements. I'll tell you what, delete the CNN and MSNBC channels from your TV. Okay, good. Good choice. Delete, delete them. Just delete them and let, uh, you know, Nielsen, whoever does the ratings, solve the problem. Just delete them because they're vulgar. Okay, excellent. And do you see uh, what's happening with the uh, Trump administration and all the attacks on him? Are you as alarmed about that as we are? Uh, yes, I am, and I, uh, I'm throwing my pillow at the TV around here these days. Uh, this is an all-out war, and I'm not sure if President Trump understands that this will not stop until they got him flat on the ground. He had, he had better up his game on fighting against them. Just calling them out is not going to be good enough. I don't care what method he uses, crash them. Mm -hmm. I don't care anymore. I agree. don't care anymore. Just make sure they drop jazz. As companies, they should cease to exist. Yeah, and I agree with that because they they will not stop until they destroy him or they're destroyed themselves. It's a, it's, it's a war to the bitter end, no question about it. That would be my comment to him. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, always remember that Lenin was a newspaper guy. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Harry, I hate to say this, but we've run out of time again, and I, I, we we could go another hour easily uh, with what you've got to say. I believe we need to get you back again very, very soon because we need to continue with this dialogue. Uh, would you like to take just a second to uh, uh, discuss your book and where where our listeners can go to buy that book? Oh, it's... Uh quite simple. Uh, I, I made sure that that's very findable. You just go to Amazon.com and put in AMA, 
B H U L U. Ama Bulu with a H after the B. A M A B H U L U. Stick it into Amazon and it will just fill the page. Or just put that word into uh, into Google. It should fill a couple of pages with a book for you. <laughs> well, and I have to tell our our listeners. Uh, I've read the book and it's a fantastic historical work that really covers all of South Africa from the very beginning in 1653 until uh, within just a few years. And uh, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Harry, you, well, I know I'm not mistaken, you do a uh, kind of a newsletter as well, and you kind of update some of the things that are happening in South Africa for uh, people that are interested in being part of your yeah. update. It's basically a blog under the same name. I'm pretty sure if folks put Amabulu, in, uh, A-M-A-B-H-U-L-U, if they stick that into uh, Google, uh, they'll hit the blog. Okay, great. Well, uh, Harry, I thank you for being our guest, and I, I do want to uh, get you back on the radio show. Uh, you're so fascinating to listen to, frankly. I don't have to... I hardly have to say a word, so uh, you, you carry the whole show because you're so interesting. And uh, with that, I will ask our uh, listeners to join us again next week uh, for another Connecting the Dots radio program, and I promise that we will have uh, another interesting guest just like Harry Boyens. And, Harry, thank you again, and I'll bid our listeners uh, good evening. Thank you, and good night. Pleasure. Republic News Network for our live national broadcast. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing this radio show since 2010, and it's always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. Here we go. It's true. The United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction is in the District of Columbia. The Republic government was simply a bunch of U.S. citizens that, in law, don't have access to the Bill of Rights. And they realized they wanted to be Americans as our founders and our law provided each and every one of us. See, we've been hard at work since 2008. And since 2010, we have successfully re-inhabited the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know, it's hard to understand. Don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government. And we love our country. You can consider the Republic members are tired of the corruption that we see every day. See, we found in the law that there is two forms of government here on the land, and we did something about it. We are people, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. We have families just like you. We simply found some truths, and now we're sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. So get ready to hear things that sound amazing, and get ready to understand that you, too, are about to be a part of history.